thanks for coming. Uh, I'm really delighted that Carol McGranican is here. And so many of you from the community have come, and she is uh, one of my favorite uh, anthropologists of Tibet, a really exciting person doing really, really great work. Uh, I'm going to just read to you a little bit about her background and, and what she's been doing, and also the titles of some of the things that she's been working on, so you can get an idea of what she does. She uh, characterizes herself as a cultural anthropologist and also a historian, but she's definitely specializing in contemporary Tibet uh, and issues of colonialism, empire, history and memory, power and politics, refugees and citizenship, nationalism, senses of belonging, gender, war, and anthropology as theoretical storytelling. Uh, she has done a lot of research amongst Tibetan refugee communities, in particular in, in, in India and Nepal, and she published a book called the uh, uh, on, on the Chishkandru, the uh, guerrilla army, um, uh, which is entitled Arrested Histories, Tibet, the CIA, and Histories of a Forgotten War in 2010. Um, she has been thinking about 20th and 21st century Tibetan histories and experiences as imperial in a global sense uh, as a key part of her work in relation to the CIA, uh, British India, the People's Republic of China, of course. Uh, she is currently working on a, um, well, she, she, she co-edited a volume called Imperial Formations with Ann Stoller and Peter Perdue. She's currently working on two new projects, a winter grant funded project with John Collins on ethnographies of U.S. empire and a new solo research project with Tibetans in India, Nepal, New York City, and Toronto titled Refugee Citizenship. Tibetan practices of political sub subjectivity in diaspora. And she's also working on the Pamutan family as well, which is an area that I'm very interested in too. I want to also just read you some of the titles of her articles. Um, Anthropology and the Truths of Political Asylum, um, Mal in Tibetan Disguise, History, Ethnographic Theory and Excess, Teaching Tibet in a Time of Precarious Emotion, uh, Self-Immolation as Protest in Tibet, a Special Issue of, of Cultural Anthropology, uh, Narrative Dispossession, uh, Tibet and the Gender Logics of Historical Possibility, uh, Empire Out of Bounds, Tibet in the Era of Decolonization, Tibet's uh, Cold War, the CIA and the Chuchikung Resistance, uh, in Rapa's library, the texts and times of a rebel Tibetan intellectual, that sounds really interesting. Truth, fear, lies, exile politics, and arrested histories of Tibetan renaissance, and so on and so on. So it's a great honor and pleasure to, see, to have Carol here. So please join me in welcoming her today. so much. So thank you to, to Janet and also to Joppa and Ladrin who were so uh, instrumental for inviting me here. I also want to um, acknowledge Janet uh, for being a contributor to the special issue of cultural anthropology that I co-edited with Ralph Litzinger that brought together 20 um, scholars as well as uh, intellectuals working around the world, Tibetan and non-Tibetan, in 2012 to write about the self-immolations. Um, and kind of starting from there. So thank you all, and to everyone who has come tonight. Um, I appreciate you being here on a rainy Friday night. Right. So I want to start um, by acknowledging that this is a difficult topic. And it was a very difficult topic for me initially when I first started talking and thinking about self-immolation, which is when they happened, but even more so when I was asked as a scholar of Tibet to write about the self-immolations. Um, and although that happened in January 2012, and I now stand before you, you know, two years and several months later, it has not gotten any easier. So I still find this to be an incredibly, um, it's an emotionally weighty topic. This is, this is heavy material, and it's actually the sort of material that you want to discuss um, in a group, to have people with you there. Um, I also want to be clear up front that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight graphic images, and this is one of the things I think that um, is important. It's something I resisted at first. 
in the beginning when I first started receiving news about self-immolations, it was easier for me to read about them than it was for me to look at the images. And when I was asked to edit the special issue of the, of the journal, then I had to start looking at the images. And there were uh, days where I would spend all day um, reading essays that were coming in from scholars and from intellectuals and from students around the world. And, and I just want to share with you, like up front, um, that some of this is difficult and to prepare you for some of the images that will be coming. So the first uh, question that I want to, um, to pose, but also to answer, this might be actually the only question that I answer uh, tonight, is what is self-immolation? So self-immolation in the Tibetan context is to set oneself on fire with the intention of dying. And for Tibetans, this involves um, dousing one's body with kerosene, with some form of, form of petrol, um, but often also ingesting kerosene, so not just putting it on the outside of your body, but also saturating the inside of your body such that your protest can be more efficacious. All right, so this is, when I say self-immolation, this is this specific form uh, that we're talking about, so it's something very, very clear. All right. I'm not going to promise, but <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay, so the number of self-immolators right now is 136. So... 136 Tibetans have chosen to take their lives in this fashion. Or actually, let me rephrase that. We actually don't know. Uh, there are a number of Tibetans about whom we don't know the uh, condition that they're in, whether they're alive or whether they're deceased, or even the whereabouts of their body. And that's because often in the burning state, uh, individuals are taken away by the police. So there are roughly between 15 and 20 individuals for whom we do not know if they are still alive or not. Okay. But I don't know if you can read the bottom, I'll read it for you. It's 116 men and 20 women. So this is a practice that is heavily gendered male. It has thus far mostly been men who have been doing it, but 20 women. Uh, what's covering up right here is that 100 and in the late uh, high 120s have taken place in Tibet itself. One has taken place in Beijing. And then seven have taken place in exile, four in India, and three in Nepal. There have not been any self-immolations in the Tibetan diaspora outside of South Asia. So not in North America, Europe, Japan, Australia, Taiwan, any of the many places around the world. So this has been concentrated in Tibet, and then with a small number in exile as well. The ages of the self-immolators um, has tended to be low. Most of them have been young men in their late teens and in their 20s. But the age range is as low as 16 on up to 64. So it really does span kind of the age, you know, the ages. Um, again, many have died, sorry, most have died, but some we just do not have the information for. Of the 116 men and 20 women, many of them have been parents. Uh, one third of them have been religious, meaning that they have been either monks or nuns. But that means the majority of people, actually, who are self-immolating are not monks and nuns, but they are ordinary people from all walks of life. Nomads, farmers, carpenters, students, taxi drivers, you know, any, any possible kind of occupation on the Tibetan plateau. The most recent self-immolation took place at the end of March in Batang. Uh, which is currently in Sichuan province in Tibet, Kham province. And it was a 31-year-old nun, uh, nun named Joma, uh, who self-immolated on the Kora route that circles Batang Chide Gompa Monastery. And her flames were put out by pilgrims, uh, just local Tibetans who were circumambulating doing Kora. And she was brought to the hospital, and we do not know her condition. So, um, but that was the most recent one, just a couple weeks ago. Here is the map showing you the places in Tibet where the self-immolations have taken place. And it's immediate, just on first glance, that the great majority of them are up here. And so, for those of you not familiar with Tibet, let me give you the kind of the geographic layout here. 
This area uh, down here is the historical area of Kham, and this area up here is the historical area of Amdo. Over here, kind of, we have Utsang, Hwasa, and central Tibet. And so most of the immolations have taken place in this region, kind of southeastern Amdo and northwestern Kham, of where those two meet. But you can see also that self-immolations have taken place over here. So in terms of how we understand geopolitically Tibet, you know, historically, there were um, uh, Chokasum, there were three regions, is how Tibetans might explain it, right? We have, uh, in shorthand, Kham, Amdo, and then Utsang, kind of generally over here. When China took over Tibet in the 1950s, what happened is they changed the geopolitical organization of Tibet. And this is actually a classic imperial strategy that many empires do. They partition and kind of redistribute the land, give new names to old territories. So what we now have, if we were going to lay a Chinese map uh, of the People's Republic of China on top of this, is that this area right here is Sichuan. Up here, kind of way up here, we get Gansu. Over here is Qinghai. This is Shitsang, which is, uh, in English, we call the Tibet Autonomous Region. And not fully on this map, but down here is Yunnan. So historical Tibet has been partitioned into five separate Chinese provinces. Okay, so just to give you a view, but you can see here, I think, believe with the exception of Yunnan, uh, there have been self-immolations in Shitsang, Sichuan, Qinghai, and Gansu. In Tibetan, in Amdo, Kham, and Hutsang as well as in exile. This is Sangye Gyatso. He was a 27-year-old farmer from the village of Sur in uh, Kanlo in Amdo. I'm going to get the date here. He self-immolated in October 2012. <laughs> Down here, I don't know how to, maybe if I click the X, we can make this part go away. Thank you. Sorry. No. <laughs> um, oh, okay. This. <laughs> it might be on automatic slideshow now. Right here. Um, I, I, I'm going to leave it. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's now covering the faces um, of the woman who is his wife, his five-year-old daughter, and his seven-year-old son. So in this talk, one of the things I'm going to be doing is sharing with you images of self-immolators, not only in the burning state, but also as they appeared in the world as they lived their lives, um, you know, dynamically and vibrantly, and their families, who are also a part of the story. So in Tibet, there is no history of, of self-immolation. And this is something that I'm asked a lot. You know, does Tibet have a long-standing history of, of self-immolation? Is this something that's a, you know, a long-standing Buddhist practice? And I say, no, actually, it's, it's not a Tibetan practice at all throughout history. In, uh, there's a 9th century text called the Bashe where we get a story of someone um, setting their head on fire. But it's ambiguous whether that person is actually a Tibetan or a Chinese. And then in the 11th century, we have a story of a monk named Dolchen Kukur, who sets himself on fire, who self-immolates in front of the Zhou in the Jokong Temple. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Tibet, this is kind of the most holy statue in the most holy temple in the entire country. So this happens in the 11th century, and then the next Tibetan self-immolation takes place in 1998, right? so eight centuries later. This is Tukte Ngodup. Tukte Ngodup was a member of Establishment Tutu, the Tibetan unit uh, in the Indian military. And he worked as a, a cook, just lived a, a very simple, humble life in Dharamsala. In the spring of 1998, the Tibetan Youth Congress organized a unto death hunger strike in which six Tibetans, male and female, um, of all ages, again, kind of from 20s on up through the 60s, undertook, as it says, a, a hunger strike unto death. 
Tuk Din Do volunteered as one of the helpers of the hunger strike, as someone who helped the hunger strikers go to the toilet or kind of, you know, uh, clean them, wash them down, help them take uh, water with lemon in it, th those sorts of things. They were hunger striking for 40 odd days when Indian police finally decided to stop the strike because suicide is illegal in India. So it is against the law to commit suicide. And the hunger strikers had got to the point where it was now very possible that someone might die. So the Indian police came in and arrested the hunger strikers. And in the kind of the chaos and the, you know, hullabaloo following all of this, Tuktin Godu, 63 years old at the time, quietly stood up and walked into the public toilet where he doused himself you know, with kerosene, with petrol, and came out and lit a match. And this, for Tibetans, in the contemporary period, is the first self-immolation. So he was, uh, they put out the flames, the police, he was brought to the hospital. And that night, His Holiness the Dalai Lama visited him in the hospital. And so he was able to, kind of, in his dying hours, to be counseled by the Dalai Lama on how to prepare for death in this painful state, kind of the state of suffering that he was in, and then he did pass away. Okay? But so he is the first uh, self-immolator, Tibetan self-immolator of the contemporary period. Now in general, self-immolation is actually, um, sort of tragically, considered a 20th century form of protest, and is associated with the Vietnamese monk uh, Thich Quang Duc, who self-immolated in 1963 as a protest against the Diem regime. And this particular protest, um, you, certainly there were uh, world, the world's media with this, this image, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. Um, this is now the iconic image for self-immolation, but also for self-immolation as a Buddhist form of protest, which might be something we could talk about later, especially perhaps with Janet here. Um, Self-immolation is not something um, limited at all to Buddhism, nor necessarily Buddhist at all. Right? Uh, but it takes place actually in many countries around the world. India is a country in which there have been many self-immolations in the contemporary period by people from all sorts of different occupations and caste and class and ethnic backgrounds. Contemporary China has a number of self-immolations taking place right now, kind of concurrent with the Tibetan ones, mostly in response to confiscation of house and land, the homes and land by the government. Tunisia and countries in the Middle East. But there are also places where self-immolations are taking place that you might not be familiar with. Actually, here in the United States during the Vietnam, Vietnam War, there were a number of self-immolations. Contemporary Europe, a number of self-immolations. Okay, so all sorts of places. And actually, there is even, he's not included in the count, the Tibetan count of self-immolations, but there was a British man who, self uh, who was a Tibetan Buddhist monk who lived in France who self-immolated in March 2012. As, as so of the self-immolations that have taken place in Europe, one of them was directly linked you know, to Tibet. All right, so part of what I want to try and do for you today um, is to answer, again, I wasn't going to answer many questions, but I'll do my best. What do we know about the self-immolations? Um, what is going on? Why are, are people self-immolating? You know, what is the situation in Tibet? And why have so many people now, 136, chosen this as a strategy? You know, what is it that they are trying to, to accomplish? So when I was first asked to speak to this topic, um, what I did was turn to the two disciplines. So I hold a PhD in both anthropology and in history. So I kind of have the theoretical background and the methodological uh, toolkit of each of those disciplines to draw on. And so in anthropology, the way that we do our research is by going and living in a community, by talking with people, by participating in everyday life, um, by sinking into the rhythms of the community, you know, and, and doing that. You can't do that with self-immolation. People sometimes confide in close friends right before they self-immolate, but for the most part, this is something that you can't anticipate it. You can't go and do a research project up with people who are going to self-immolate in the future. Right? So my anthropological research strategies don't work here. My historical ones don't work really well either for reasons I've already explained with you. Right? There, there is no history of self-immolation. Okay. 
I also can't necessarily go to Tibet and ask people there about it. Right? I can't even call up Tibetan friends. So there are all sorts of risks that are involved. Some of the risks involved in self-immolation you know, are evident to people who are on the ground in Tibet. They are not as evident to me. But at a minimum, I know that if I go and start asking questions, or if I even phone and start asking questions, that's not good. Right, so how, what do we do? Uh, my Tibetan friends in India and Nepal face some of the same dilemmas. And so for the most part, people wait for information to come to them. Right, that, that contacts, friends, and relatives in Tibet are going to be the ones who initiate kind of the communication. And so there is now a kind of trusted network and groups of both Tibetans, but also kind of, of scholars um, who are participating in receiving the information that's coming out. But one of the things that's so difficult is, is getting information. So when I say there are 136 Tibetans who have self-immolated, that number might be too low there still might be some self-immolators about whom we do not know. You know, about whom their story has not come out. Perhaps it hasn't even transgressed, you know, kind of the boundaries of their village or their district. Right? But so numbers and knowledge is something that here uh, is, is very much a gray zone of kind of, of uncertainty and of trying to learn, but of never knowing for sure. One person who has been absolutely instrumental in collecting information about the immolations, purposefully seeking it out, and then sharing it with the outside world has been a Tibetan journalist uh, based in Beijing named Husser. So right here you see the cover of a book of hers that came out last October. Uh, currently it's only available in French. Um, hopefully maybe an English translation will be out. She blogs um, in Chinese. And her writings are regularly translated into English uh, by Dijin Pemba in London for the blog High Peaks Pure Earth. As well as she regularly has, um, she recently had a column in the New York Times and both Voice of America and Radio Free Asia often do interviews with her. So she is active in getting the word out and actually much of what we do know is through indebtedness to Wu Sir, who has actually won many prizes for journalistic bravery of, as a uh, Tibetan woman living in the People's Republic of China. Uh, actually, the, um, so the title, if, if you don't read French, actually, says Immolations of Tibet, the Shame of the World. And I want to point out that the cover art, and I don't know if you can fully see, but um, the na names of all of the self-immolators is written in Tibetan. It's also written in white, so it might be a little difficult to see from your particular vantage point. But the drawing of the flames was done by Ai Weiwei. So the Chinese kind of dissident artist based in Beijing. So this is a collaboration between, uh, the text inside is all by Wu Sir, but the art on the cover by Ai Weiwei. So kind of an example of what we've seen in the last decade of certain Tibetan intellectuals and um, certain figures in Beijing, mostly on the eastern seaboard, uh, building new relationships with Tibetans inside of China. All right, so I've mentioned several times the volume um, of writings that I and a bunch of other scholars did on the self-immolations. Again, trying to just ask ourselves, how can we speak to this? Right, how can we begin to apprehend, to understand, to comprehend what's going on, and then as scholars to try and make sense of this, to put it in some sort of context, whether it's a cultural context, a historical one, a religious one, a political one, a, an economic one, all of the above. Right? This is our job as scholars, is to make, make things uh, visible and understandable, and yet really feeling stymied by this, and again, feeling that it was some sort of collective project. Other efforts to do so um, by scholars and by intellectuals, there was a conference held in Paris uh, on, in the spring of 2012. Similar, both of these two projects have generated online sets of essays that you can go and read and that you may or may not be useful for you in trying to you know, come to terms for yourself with how do I understand this phenomenon. A conference was also held in India. So there have been a small number of efforts by folks like myself to grapple with this, but for the most part, it's something that's um, just as difficult, you know, perhaps for someone like myself as it is for any of you in this room, whether you are a Tibetan or someone who's curious about Tibet or someone who knows a lot about Tibet and are not Tibetan. You know, this is a topic that's not easily understandable. Um, 
easily sympathize with, perhaps, easily felt in terms of some depth of emotion, but not truly easy to comprehend. Journalists have also been important in, in getting the story out, or not sometimes, as the case may be. Um, but one of the things that happened very early on is if you remember that map that I put up in that area where most of the self immolations had taken place, the Chinese government almost immediately, once a pattern started emerging, closed that area to journalists. So it is now, uh, and still, you know, in this period, yeah. absolutely closed. So journalists do not have access you know, to the regions of Tibet at all. You know, where the majority of the self-immolations are taking place. They also do not have access, however, to Lhasa or the Tibet Autonomous Region unless they are there on some sort of official trip. There are no foreign journalists based in Tibet. You know, there is no New York Times reporter, Hossa Bureau. There are more foreign journalists in North Korea than there are in Tibet. Right. Right, which is something that catches people often by surprise. So the journalists who have been able to write about this uh, are getting their information either you know, through well, clandestine sources or through the exile community, or some of them have snuck in. And so there have been a few kind of intrepid journalists uh, who have managed to get in and actually have done some, some valuable reporting. But no one's done that for a while, actually. It kind of it's, it's tapered off, maybe because it was winter. Uh, perhaps someone will be sneaking in once the, the snow thaws and the pass is open. Um, but really, this has been one of the problems. People often complain that there hasn't been a lot of media coverage. And one of the reasons is that journalists can't get in. And uh, what does a journalist mostly want to do be on the ground covering a story? Right? So that has been um, a, an issue. So who are the, the primary journalists involved in this? Citizen journalists. So most of the information coming out, but also most of the photos coming out, most of the videos coming out are shot by Tibetan citizens of the PRC, just local Tibetans who happen to be walking down the street or happen to be returning from a ceremony at the monastery. I just happen to be there as I understand it, right? when a self-immolation happens. And they take out their phone, they take a photograph, they take a video, they write a text, they make a call ASAP to get that out before perhaps their phone is confiscated. So Tibetan citizen journalists have been the primary source of information coming out of Tibet. And again, for the world's media, this isn't verifiable, credible news information in the way that they really want, right? This is secondhand. You don't know the person who sent it. And so the Tibetan government and, and Tibetan activists kind of in exile work to verify this information, work to verify these photos, right, to make sure it's not photoshopped or, or staged. So there's different things that the exile community is doing to show journalists the credibility of the information or of the visual documentation. And yet still, you know, the new, they want their own people in. So something happened in April 2012 that changed this for the world's media. This is Jampa Yashi. Jampa Yashi self-immolated in Delhi, India. In April 2012, on the video of Hu Jin, uh, video on the visit of Chinese President Hu Jintao to Delhi, the world's media was there. The Associated Press was there, Reuters was there, New York Times, The Times of India, Guardian, you know, all of the big international news outlets were there. They got their own photographs shot by their own photographers. And it was with Jampa Yeshi's self-immolation that all of a sudden the story of Tibetan self-immolations became a bigger one for the Tibetan, uh, sorry, for the world's media. This is Jampa Yeshe in his lifetime. And so since April 2012, there has been more coverage. And yet I'm one of those people who believes there has not been enough. So what it would take, uh, I don't entirely know, but I think it would take, again, you know, this sort of first-hand coverage, the ability of journalists to get into Tibet itself, to be able to cover the story again kind of from the ground the way that they want. Um, so again, Jampa Yeshe 
as he was before his self mutilation So my talk, um, the subtitle of it is Protest, Offerings, and Communication. And what I want to emphasize right now is that I don't consider self these self-immolations to be suicides. And the reason I don't consider them to be suicides is that I understand that the self-immolators themselves and the Tibetan community did not consider these to be suicides. So these deaths are categorized in a different way. Right? To self-immolate is to, is to give an offering of the body in a fashion that's not congruent with the, the taking of one's life through suicide. So, something different. The protest part is fairly clear, and that's the one where people usually start with protest and end with protest. This is a photo from 2008. So in the spring of 2008, uh, all of Tibet pretty much erupted in protest. And several things were going on. This was in advance of the Summer Olympics in Beijing, right, which took place in the summer of 2008. Uh, the protest started kind of the end of February, but really took hold in March of 2008. Uh, a number of things happened. Things happened in Lhasa. Things happened, uh, especially in what is now the main region of the self-immolations. But protests took place throughout Tibet, and there are a couple things I want to emphasize about this period. The first is that these were the largest protests we've seen in Tibet since 1959. 1959 is the year of the mass Tibetan uprising in Lhasa, upon which His Holiness the Dalai Lama fled Lhasa to India. He fled Lhasa to India thinking he'd be coming back, you know, within a month or two perhaps, or at least a year, right, and still remains in exile today. But since 1959, there have been protests, but 2008, uh, 50 years later, right, marks the biggest set of protests since then. These protests also, also took place pretty much throughout Tibet. They were also participated in by Tibetans from all walks of life. Whereas protests in earlier periods, some in the 80s and some in the 90s, had mostly been monks or nuns, so the religious uh, people in Tibet. But this one really was widespread. One of the things that scholars and I think activists both believe was instrumental in having these protests be so widespread, not just geographically, but also socially and economically, was the use of cell phones. People could now call friends and relatives who were in different cities, different towns across the Tibetan plateau and tell them what was happening in their community. And this was something you couldn't do in earlier times when there was only a landline and not many people had landlines in their homes. You had to go to some sort of store or business or office to make a call. But mobile phone technology has enabled new forms of Tibetans, new forms of communication between Tibetans in Tibet that I believe facilitated kind of the widespread nature of these protests in 2008. And this really marked a change. So a couple of things, many things, have, have come from this period. Uh, but one was a movement called Lakar. So the Lakar movement is one thing that came out of this, which is sort of a movement and also a pledge that Tibetans make inside Tibet um, to do such things, such as uh, to buy vegetables from a Tibetan vegetable seller versus a Chinese. To make a pledge on one day per week, you're going to speak only the Tibetan language and not speak Chinese. You are going to wear Tibetan clothing, for example, on one day per week. So different things that were going to enable Tibetans to publicly express their Tibetan identity. So this specifically, one thing that came out of of the 2008 protests. And I want to emphasize here that the Lockhart movement while this itself was new, such forms of protest by Tibetans in the People's Republic of China were not new. And so if you look back to the 1950s and look at what Tibetan prisoners were doing in jail in the 50s and the 60s, they were doing similar sort of things, trying to find ways to assert a Tibetan identity that they had been denied. And one book that perhaps some of you might have read here, and if not, I can direct you to it, is Ama Ade's biography. And in this book, she gives numerous examples of things that she and the other prisoners did to try and hold on to a Tibetan identity that they were being denied. After, for example, all of the women's braids were cut off into the unisex, uh, kind of almost bobbish hairstyle that they were required to have. Right? And then no longer feeling like a Tibetan woman, trying to find ways to assert 
now that ethnic identity as well as perhaps a gendered one. So although Vakar is new, ideas and practices of Tibetans kind of asserting an identity vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese state is something that we can see you know, from the very beginning in some ways of the Chinese takeover. The next thing that I want to emphasize that happened in relationship to the 2008 protests took place on March 16th, 2009. And this was the self-immolation of a young monk named Tape. Tape was a monk at Kirti Monastery. And one year before, during the 2008 riots, Kirti Monastery had been particularly attacked and assaulted by Chinese security forces. And so on the anniversary of the attack, you know, on which, uh, on the anniversary of the attack, let's just leave it at that for now, uh, Tape self-immolated. He was the first self-immolation, first Tibetan to self-immolate since 1998, when Tuk Dingo self-immolated in Delhi. The next self-immolation took place two years later, on March 16th, 2011. So now on the third anniversary of the Kirti Monastery incident. There has been a self-immolation on March 16th every year since then by a monk from Kirti Monastery. So there was one in 2009, one in 2011, one in 2012, one in 2013, and one in 2014, each by a monk from Kirti Monastery. This year, a monk from another monastery also self-immolated on the same day. So after the self-immolation on March 16th, 2011, kind of a, a couple, the self-immolations really began as I date them, kind of after these initial ones, following August 2011. August 2011 is when His Holiness the Dalai Lama stepped down as the political leader of Tibet. And this as I see it, is the moment when the self-immolations really increase. So starting in the fall of 2011 through today, and um, just I was updating the number and, and couldn't bear to look at times. And I thought that was bad. And then November 2012 happened. No November 2012 was the 18th uh, Communist Party Congress in Beijing. So a big political event was taking place in China. 28 Tibetans self-immolated in November 2012. I mean, it's a number that's just absolutely, absolutely staggering. 28. So when Tibetans who are self-immolating are, are in the burning state, one thing that other Tibetans who happen to be in that area do is they often surround them. And they do this for numerous reasons. One is to protect them from the Chinese security forces, from taking them away. Um, sometimes it's to try and put out the flames. Sometimes it seems to be to allow the person to burn. And, and I don't know what decisions are made you know, in, in this instance. In, you know, there seem to be a number of different things happening. But one thing is that when you come close to someone who's self-immolating, you can hear what they're saying. And many of the self-immolators are saying things while they are burning. And of those for whom they, what they are saying is audible and has been reported, uh, it's actually very consistent, the things that they are saying. They are saying things like, long live the Dalai Lama. May the Dalai Lama return to Tibet. You know, free Tibet, Puran. China out of Tibet. And there is absolute consistency across what we have from Tibetans in all different areas of Tibet whose words in the burning state has been audible. Right? So these are, these are the things that just again and again people are saying. So, 
even though Tibetans try to protect the body and defend the body, there have been numerous times, as I've uh, shared with you, when bodies have been, uh, not, not just bodies, um, people, right, still burning, have been taken away, sometimes also when deceased bodies have been taken away. And so this becomes a problem um, for families. How do you do a funeral when you do not have the body? How do you send your loved one you know, into, you know, onto the next phase, onto the next stage, when you do not have the body? And it's not just in Tibet, but pretty much in every society around the world that the body is important for funeral rites. This is something that matters pretty much to everyone, everywhere. And without the body, you can't fully, right, send your loved family member or loved friend on. It is not just China that's confiscated bodies and people, however. Two of the self-immolators in Nepal had their bodies confiscated by the Nepali government. And despite the requests of the Tibetan community there, as well as international requests, the Nepali government did not return those two bodies. So this is not just an issue between Tibet and China, but also one you know, for Tibetans in Nepal and potentially in India as well, you know, for Tibetans anywhere. And you can see here, I guess let me just talk for a moment about the image. So this is a funeral in which they actually do have the body, although I chose a photo in which the, the body is not fully visible. Um, but what is visible here is the landscape and, and the huge right, gathering of monks right, to perform this right and, and to successfully, to properly, to auspiciously send this person on. You also see here images of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And while many of you might know that it is illegal to have an image of the Dalai Lama in Tibet, you can be arrested and put in jail for that, there might be some folks in here who do not know that. So I want to share with everyone here tonight that the fact that there are images of the Dalai Lama here, even though there is political risk involved, shows just how strongly Right, the community feels about having images of the Dalai Lama present at this particular ritual, right? the need for that presence. This is Nolan Norpel and Tenzin Kedup. I don't know who was who. No, when Norpal's 22 years old and Tenzin K. Duke was 24 years old when they decided to self-immolate together. No, when Norpal was taken away by the police and it's unknown still um, what his condition or whereabouts is. This was 21 June 2012, so we're coming up on, this was two years ago that they self-immolated. Tenzin K. Duke died on the spot. And this is in Jay Kundo, so this is in Kundo. It's important to me that I say the names of the people who self-immolated. Right? Again, this is Nawang Norpel and Tenzin Kedu. Um, and I feel it's important, even in the, the state of burning and at the moment of death or the moment of uncertainty, right, about knowing where someone is, to recognize these people as human, right? And to kind of to, to give them that recognition of, of saying the names, of, of honoring that in, in some way. Small though it may be, I think it's actually um, a large one. Not to have, even though the number of self-immolations now it feels very high, to not allow them to become some sort of uh, you know mass that's homogenized, but to pause with each of the individuals. All right. So while doing. At the time that I was working on um, you know, this journal issue about the self-immolations, I was also teaching a class about Tibet. So I am a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I actually teach two classes about Tibet. I teach one small one that has about 30 students in it. But I also teach one very large lecture class about Tibet that has 250 students in it. But 250 students before me learning about Tibetan culture, history, politics, religion, you name it. And the semester that I was working on the special issue of the journal happened to be the semester that I was teaching the 250 students. 
I had a wonderful Tibetan student who was one of my teaching assistants, and her name is Dawa Lokitsong, and I want to acknowledge that her father is here with us tonight, and that's a big honor for me. So, very glad to have you here. Um, and so myself, and Dawa, and my two other TAs, we're charged, not charged, as human beings. Um, Dao as a Tibetan, myself as someone who is a, a, a scholar of Tibet and who has benefited from Tibet, who has learned from Tibet, who has been welcomed into the community in so many ways. Wanted, you know, had to make this part of the class. You know, had to share with my students what was going on? You know, I couldn't just teach them about Tibetan kinship or you know this is how the Tibetan government is structured and not say what was happening today in this moment. And I can't tell you that semester how many times I walked into class and our class was at 10 o'clock in the morning. I still remember it was a Monday, Wednesday. I lectured Monday, Wednesday, 10 o'clock. And I'd come in and most of my students were Typical college age, 18, 19, 20, maybe 21. And I would stand before them, like I'm standing before you, and say, today, in Tibet, at 6 o'clock p.m., at a time we haven't come to yet, right, in Colorado, a 19-year-old man self-immolated and died. And I would look out at this class of 19-year-old young men right, and young women looking back at me. And pause, right? And then, so, okay, well, what are we reading for today? What can I draw on you know, from my knowledge? What can I take from what we've read together? And actually, that semester, we happened to be reading Ama Ade's book. We had also read a book by Jeff Childs on Tibetan Diary that talked about funeral rites. So a number of things that they had read in class, they could also kind of pull from that and say, okay, well, I've learned this. How does this come into play? Right? Or what happens when this happens? Or what, what about X? What about Y? But mostly, you know, we would do our best to draw from the resources we had, you know, which was each other, the literature, and also a, a sense of humanity, of being a caring person in the world. Right? And of uh, telling my students, um, when you're a professor, it's okay to not know the answers. You know, I have to say to my students, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. I'll, I'll find it out and get back to you next class. Right. But this wasn't just a problem of not knowing the answers. You know, this is also a problem of not knowing the questions. Right. Like not really having a clear grip on, on either. A number of self-immolators have left behind written or even video testimonies. And so I want to share one with you here that was put up on the internet. So I found this here. This is Kelsan uh, uh, So Paolo. Paolo means martyr, so that is not his first name. But this says martyr, Kelsan uh, <coughs> Self-immolated November 27th, 2012. So this was again that month when 28 people self-immolated. And I'll read this out loud. Greetings. To my dear brothers and sisters, and especially my parents, the kindest of all in this world, I am setting myself on fire for the sake of Tibet. The long life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama must be assured. It is my wish that the sun of happiness may shine on the land of Tibet. This is Rikyo. She self-immolated on May 30th, 2012. She was 33 years old. And she was a nomad and the mother of two children. I'm the mother of two children. And the parents self-immolating has been one of the hardest things for me to come to terms with. The thinking of um, you know, parents leaving behind kids. You know, one of the things that, that really tugs on my personal heartstrings. So, um, here she is, Rikyo. Rikyo left behind a testimony. So the title is Prayers for World Peace and Happiness. I'm going to read it to you. To ensure His Holiness the Dalai Lama's return to Tibet, do not indulge in slaughtering and trading of animals. Do not steal. Speak Tibetan. 
do not fight. Bearing all sufferings of sentient beings on myself, do not resist by fighting if I get into Chinese hands alive. Be united. Study Tibetan culture. On fire I burn. Do not worry, my family. So her testimony is one of the ones that was, was sourced by Wusser, the Tibetan writer and journalist who I mentioned before. And it was provided by Wusser um, to Dijin Pemba in London, who has translated together there, uh, working as quite an effective team, and translated and, and brought to the world. So it's through the two of them that I have this, that we have this, to read and, and to sit with. And to This is Lama Suba. He was 42 years old. At the time of his self-immolation, he was the first Rinpoche to self-immolate. On January 8, 2012, he was also the first Tibetan to self-immolate for whom we had a testimony left behind. And I'm going to read just a fragment from his. He says, I am giving my body as an offering of light to chase away the darkness, to free all beings from suffering. <clears throat> so I want to now turn to the second part of my subtitle, which is offering. And to say that many uh, self-immolators as Tibetan community and folks like myself also see the self-immolations, again, not just as protest, but also as an offering. And this is really understood as an offering in the Buddhist sense. So definitely positioned in place within a Buddhist framework. One story that comes up again and again when we think of offerings and specifically think of self-immolation is the story of the hungry tigress, which I'm guessing many of you in this room know. So just to tell it quickly, this is a story of um, a mother tiger and her cubs who basically did not have any food. And so one day the Buddha was out for a walk and came across kind of this mother tigress in her den with her cubs and saw kind of the mother looking enviously, or not enviously, but looking hungrily at her cubs and the cubs doing the same. And so what the Buddha did is he offered up his body as food for the mother tiger and her cubs so that she did not have to eat her cubs or vice versa. Right? So the idea of offering up the body to alleviate the suffering of others. And this particular story is perhaps the most resonant, with which at least I'm familiar, but certainly the ones that many Tibetans and again scholars of Tibet have shared it again and again, in particularly thinking about the self-immolations as an offering of the body to alleviate the suffering of others. So fire, while the body, while the burning body has not historically been an offering that Tibetans have made you know, to the gods, fire has been, right? In the form of whether it's burning incense or the burning of butter lamps. And butter lamps are something that you would find here, this is in the context of a monastery, but also in, in, in your home, right? You, you would burn butter lamps, or now perhaps electric lamps, right, on your altar, um, as well. So the idea of fire as an offering is something that has been prevalent, right, in Tibetan culture, in both the home and the monastery. Um, and I don't know at what point it starts in history, but certainly it has been part of it historically for a very long time. So the idea of fire as offering. And let me refer to Lama Suba's testimony to come back. He said, I give my body as an offering of light. Right? So what is the, the lamps providing also? Light. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama um, initially was, was quite quiet on the self-immolations and did not say very much. And then as, as time went on, was, was really called upon to speak. And um, of the things he has said, and I... He's been fairly muted, actually, on this. Um, saying it is sad, but it's understandable. That the reason for this, the responsibility you know, for the conditions, rests with the Chinese. And that the self-immolators 
you know, are not causing harm to others. All right? They're they're harming themselves, right? They're doing this to themselves. And while he hasn't, you know, he hasn't talked with the majority of the self-immolators, I don't know if he actually I don't know if he's spoken with any of the ones in India, certainly not in Nepal. He said what matters is their individual motivation. Right? And we just we don't know this. Um, but so His Holiness the Dalai Lama really, I think, has been exercising uh, a lot of restraint in speaking about the self immolation so has not said a lot. So I'm going to move now to the communication part of uh, protest offering communication. And what I think is going on here is that the Tibetan self-immolators self uh, are not speaking to what, just one group, but are really speaking to multiple audiences. Clearly, they're speaking to China. Um, so they are clearly speaking out, it seems, about their dissatisfaction with the Chinese state, with different Chinese policies, whether it has to do with religious policies, with restrictions on monks, whether it has to do with patriotic re-education, whether it has to do with um, you know, the demarking of boundaries, the resettling of nomads, uh, economic policies, political ones, religious. My guess is that for some people, some are amplified, some particular reasons, but for many self-immolators, it's a combination. How has China responded kind of is a different question. So in the beginning, China also didn't do very much and, and sort of was a little silent on this. And then things started to change. Uh, so once the number of self-immolations self really started to rise, the Chinese government got much more aggressive. Um, they started to blame the Dalai Lama, uh, saying that this is a, uh, now I'm going to use this direct quote, a criminal act premeditated, plotted, manipulated by the Dalai clique and overseas separatists. Uh, denying that they are taking place. So just recently, uh, Pema Cholin, uh, top Tibetan official in China, has said that there are no local residents or monks or nuns in the Tibet Autonomous Region have self-immolated. Right? So just denying that it's happening. Now by saying no local residents, monks or nuns, have self-immolated, my guess, although I don't have the data or information to confirm this, is that those individuals who have self-immolated in the Tibet Autonomous Region perhaps hold residency permits uh, for other parts of Tibet. You know, maybe they actually came from Amdo, uh, parts of Amdo or Kham that are in Sichuan or Qinghai. So he phrases it in a way such that it sounds like they haven't t taken place when clearly they have. Um, just two months ago, in February of 2014 in Sichuan, uh, a new punishment was announced. So earlier it had been announced that accomplices of self-immolators were going to be punished and arrested. And the Chinese have held true to this. So numerous people have actually been arrested for being friends or, or family members. But in February of 2014, a new policy was announced in Sichuan where even more stringent punishments are now in place for family members of self-immolators, for villages where self-immolations take place, and for monasteries where self-immolations take place. So a whole new set of rules. Ah, that's not where we're supposed to be. Okay. A second group that the Tibetans are speaking to is the UN and the world community. So, you know, definitely, you know, clearly trying to get the world to listen, perhaps hoping, hoping that the UN might do something. Um, I, I am guessing that many people in this room hopefully are aware by now that the UN really does not, there's not much the UN can do vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, and certainly in terms of China's policy on Tibet, you know, the, the United Nations really, United Nations at the moment really does not have any traction in terms of, of affecting political change in China. Let's just admit it, right? So we have not seen that happen. It would take change in both the United Nations and change in China, you know, for there really to be the ability for the United Nations and such a body to really affect change in, in Chinese policy in Tibet. Nonetheless, um, the global community is definitely, I, I think, one of the ones to whom that self immolators are speaking. But the main community, the Tibetans are speaking to are other Tibetans. And this is something that is clear time and again. 
a number of the testimonies that have left behind include language such as Tibetans unite, Tibetan brothers inside and outside of Tibet come together, and these calls for unity uh, are really striking. And again, this is something that, that we're seeing in the post-2008 period that the self-immolators are speaking to, but that is being echoed in Tibetan music and in Tibetan poetry. So this particular call for unity. So I think, and you know, my, my belief, as I listen to what people are saying, what the self-immolators are saying, is that they're speaking to China. They are speaking to the global community, but they are speaking primarily you know, to other Tibetans and calling for unity um, and for action of some sort. So what are Tibetans doing, right? What are Tibetans in exile doing? Um, all sorts of things. So there have been hunger fasts organized. There is a movement called Chalk Tibet, right, where um, kind of public protest art is staged, where someone lays down and you outline, you know, a chalk outline of their body and then put information about, you know, self-immolation. So things such as this. Uh, online writings, op-ed pieces, community forums, um, you know, all sorts of fundraisers and different things to try and generate awareness within the community and to try and generate awareness among, you know, external communities as well. Protest is something that Tibetans have been um, doing tons of. And here you see an example of uh, one that actually took place in India. Some of you might know this young man. Um, and Tibetans also, in many of the protests, uh, including the names and including the image of the individual self immolators So back to the point I was making about the importance of really recognizing each of them as individuals rather than just as self immolators plural, but pausing right with each one. So you see right here very, very vividly. Uh, just recently, on April 4th, one week ago today, the Tibetan government, um, so the Tibet government's museum, which is operated by the Department of Information and International Relations in Dharamsala, uh, inaugurated a special exhibit on the self-immolations. So Dharamsala has just, just one week ago today, launched this. So there is now a museum exhibit on the self-immolations in Dharamsala. So could one new thing to do this there. Okay. Uh, here's a forum in Minnesota that took place. And I want to kind of point out a few things here. Um, and some of you might be saying, why Minnesota? So Minnesota, the Minneapolis area, actually has one of the largest concentrations of Tibetans in the United States. So New York is first, then it's kind of the Bay Area, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, and then Minnesota. Minneapolis uh, has a very large community. So a forum here, you can see up at the top, Bakar. So the movement inside Tibet that I had spoken about, also Lakar Solidarity Movements in Exile. Um, so there's a website, there's both a Lakar website, but there's also a website called Lakar Diaries, where um, Tibetans in exile, especially young Tibetans, writing in solidarity and talking about their own um, efforts and commitments perhaps to speak just Tibetan right, rather than English, maybe, right, on, uh, on Wednesdays. Which we, um, so there you go, an open community forum, let your voices be heard. I discuss your ideas. So one of the recent self-immolations that took place was a man named Kucho Setin, and I thought I had his photo for you, but it doesn't seem to be coming up. Um, but kind of in terms of what's going on right now, his story, I think, kind of sadly speaks to, to many of these themes. So he self-immolated on December 4th uh, of 2013, so just a couple months ago, 30-year-old man from Naba. Um, father, two kids. Uh, his wife and his relatives were arrested after his self-immolation. So not just his body was taken away. We don't know if he's, he, he was taken away. Excuse me for a second. Uh, we don't know if he is alive or dead right now or where he is, but his wife and relatives of his were also arrested. So just giving you a, a specific case, you know, an actual case of not just someone who's self-immolated, but whose relatives were arrested and who have not yet been released. What he said, um, while well, he was burning, was long live the Dalai Lama and let's unite Tibetans inside 
and outside. So Tibetans here and Tibetans in exile. So again, that idea of speaking to Tibetans outside, right? And so Tibetans outside hearing these calls, receiving these calls, and working together to try and figure out what to do, right? And coming up with multiple answers, but no singular answer. Right? But hopefully putting them all together in, in some sense. So one thing that has been for me, perhaps for some of you, um, a welcome and valued way to try and, and, and apprehend, to try and think about the self immolations has been contemporary art. And a number of contemporary artists have in the last few years created artwork dedicated to the self-immolators and about the self-immolations. So this particular image is by Karma Punso, who was a classically, or is a classically trained Tonka artist, so a uh, religious painter, who then became a contemporary painter. He's currently based in Australia. And this particular image, here you see, well, um, there's a lot going on here. Um, you can see the patala in the background. You can see the flames, right? the deity image, the soldiers, the monks in pain. And at the top, Om Mani Pimikul, which we're going to come back to in a few minutes. But I want to also point out the style of this. There are Tibetan themes and Tibetan styles throughout this, and yet this is also a very classic kind of 20th century pop culture aesthetic here. Right? And so really, Tibetans also pulling on the depths of Tibetan resources, but also pulling on other ideas to try and bear this, right? to try and bear the suffering, the knowledge, receiving these stories, these, this information, kind of this awareness of suffering. This is a piece by Gokar Gyatso. And Gokar Gyatso um, is the artist who is widely considered kind of to be the founder of, of, the contem of contemporary Tibetan art in the present. Right? He trained in Beijing and then came back to Lhasa and started um, a guild, artist guild called Sweet Tea House. He's currently, he came out then to India, was based in Dharamsala for a while, and is now based in London. And you can see here in this image, uh, many of his images actually are, are similar to this, kind of these outlines of, of Buddha images. And you can see here, actually you probably can't, um, images here of self-immolators and then with the flames, right, kind of imposed on the head of the Buddha. And so we have the Buddha in the flames. This is a work by Tashi Norbu, who is a Tibetan artist based in Europe. And... The Buddha is melting. Right. And just look at, look at this one. But again, a classic, iconic um, tonka pose. Right? Kind of a figure of a Buddha surrounded by clouds, different images, red, and you can just see the, right, the melting. Here is a take on the classic Wheel of Life. And this one also, if you're not close enough to see, this one also uses images of the self immolators here in the wheel, pulling out the wheel, am animating the wheel of life with people who have chosen right, to self immolate. <coughs> At the top, right, no face given. And flames surrounding. This particular image um, is, is a riff of sorts on a Tibetan medical tanka. Right? So you can see over here with this figure the different channels of the body, right, in the labels, the body. We have the flames and a vulture on the shoulder, right, of the day. So a vulture is a reference to Tibetan practices of sky burial, right, in which vultures are part of the practice. So a, a specific cultural reference to death. Down here we have. See, these are self-immolators in flames, right, with their arms outstretched. Alright. So I still don't fully know, you know, how, how to understand this. Again, how, how to receive these stories and, and this information, what to draw on from my knowledge,
knowledge, from my experience, from my friends, you know, from books, um, that's going to really you know, illuminate this in some way, or make it bearable, or, or make it clear, or make it, <coughs> I don't think it's possible necessarily to make it okay, and yes, it has to be okay, right? This is what people have chosen to do. And again, figuring out the answers, figuring out the questions is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. You know, what do we do, right? How do we act? And so actually one of the things I would say to my students when we would be in that moment in class, at the end of class, you know, I kind of take a minute and say, okay, when six o'clock comes around, what will you be doing? Will you be reading for tomorrow's class? Will you be having dinner with friends? Maybe out playing basketball? Maybe on the phone with your mother? What will we be doing when we reach that time? I wish someone has already self-immolated. And just, it gets sitting with it. Not answering the question, but just posing it and kind of collectively being there to listen, to hear, to think, to receive, right, and then bidding them farewell until next class. So the question in some ways becomes, right, how do we, how do we continue with, with the mundane, you know, with all the kind of silly little things you need to do, like buying milk and making dinner and doing the laundry, right, when people on the other side of the world are choosing to do things that are so strong and fearless and extraordinary. And yet when we all leave this room, we're all going to go out and return to you know, different parts of our life and things we need to do tonight and things you might need to do tomorrow morning. Right? And so putting together that the mundane, right, the quotidian, the everyday, the ordinary, with these extraordinary actions that some people are choosing to do, right? And kind of having those, bringing them together, allowing them to be okay, and at the same time never allowing it to be anything other than unsettled, right? because that's all it can be. So grappling with the impossible uh, is really what I feel like I'm doing um, and what we're all doing. Um, the impossibility of, of fully understanding, um, of sympathizing, of empathizing, but not fully knowing or, or, or getting it. And so what I think we are doing, and in some ways the only real thing perhaps that we can do, is to witness. Right? And to be a witness you know, to what is happening. Um, and to think about that right now we are in a moment of change in Tibet. And of this, this is happening. You know, from 2008 until now. Right? And when you're in a moment, you don't know where it's going to go. So it's impossible to say right now kind of where the historical winds or our political winds are going to take us. And if we came together, this, this exact group of people, every single one of us five years from now into this very room, I don't know if I would stand before you and be talking about the self-immolations that continue that are still taking place five years from now. Or if we would be in a period where we have come to something new and Tibetans are no longer self-immolating for whatever reasons it happens to be. But at a minimum, right, change is happening now in Tibet. And Tibetans are speaking out right, and asking that something change. So when 136 Tibetans in three years right, self-immolate, um, this is a grassroots movement, right? Again, these are ordinary people. They're, they're not elites. They're not, um, you know, from the lowest group. They're just people from everywhere, right? So in this moment of, of something not being right, of there being some unsettling element of society to the point that people come to clarity, right, on the need to self-immolate, 
think that again brings us to kind of really consider collectively the responsibility of witnessing, but sort of also the pain. And to acknowledge here, this is where I want to kind of come to questions of suffering. Um, this is Pudden Shitso. She was the second female to self-immolate, a 35-year-old nun in Tau. She self-immolated on November 3rd, 2011, at noon, in the center of town. She was captured on video. And she had confided to friends before her self-immolation that she felt the depths of humiliation and oppression in Tibet um, of, of Chinese policies in Tibet couldn't be overcome until the Dalai Lama returned. And only then could Tibetans regain their sense of community and kind of regain their sense of self as Tibetans. In the burning state, she yells out, she yells out free Tibet, and she also yells out um, Dalai Lama return to Tibet. And I'm going to show you the video now. Work. Why he made the art the way he did. 
So he says first that he wanted to represent her in flames, right? So we have the, the colors of fire. We have red, we have orange, we have yellow. And he wanted to portray her standing upright. You know, very much as you see her in the video, she's just a very upright figure. But to capture that, but also to put the words, Om Mani Pimit Hum, around her. Okay? And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, he writes in the essay that Om Mani Pimit Hum is the national mantra of Tibet. And but this is basically, this is not just um, the most common mantra of Tibet, but this is specifically the mantra associated with uh, Avalokiteshvara, with Chen Resig, with the Dalai Lama. And so therefore, to say and to repeat the mantra, Om Mani Pei Hum, which many Tibetans do just in their everyday practice, habitually even, I would say, is to, um, sorry, is to, to offer blessings and to request protection for Tibet and for the Dalai Lama, kind of as much as for oneself. Right. And so he wanted, he writes, I want to think of her in the way most Tibetans would be at the time of death, which is with the mantra, Om Mani Pei Hum, on their lips as they die. And he says, this is the only thing to say with self-immolations. And for anyone, um, this might just be individual for your personal, but for, for certainly for anyone who's involved in social media, um, if you follow kind of what someone puts up, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or who knows where, an announcement that there's been a self-immolation, often the only thing that people write in the comment stream that follows is Om Mani Pema Hum. Even I, a non-Tibetan, kind of will put up the name of the person, um, the date, you know, their age, where it happened, maybe a link to the story, and then write, Om Mani Pei Hum. And I think Los Gyatso is right. I mean, what, what else is there to say in many ways? Right? This encapsulates it. And Om Mani Pei Hum, he writes, is a mantra that actually helps you get to a place of compassion. Right? A place of coming closer, perhaps, to the person who's self-immolating. It allows you to, not allows you, but it, it helps you, or maybe helps facilitate a commitment of the self. Um, a feeling, maybe a new type of feeling, maybe a witnessing. And so in general, um, I'm now at the end. And like many others, and certainly like Los Angeles, I feel I, I have no other conclusion um, but to offer you the mantra again. Right? Om Mani Pei Me Hum. And this is not at all the usual conclusion for a scholarly presentation. You know, this is not an ending I've given to any other talk that I've ever given. Um, and yet, you know, scholarly work takes place in the real world. You know, not just the world as it's theorized or the world as it's desired as we want it to be, but it's engagement, at least for anthropologists, with life as it's actually lived. And right now, with the decisions that Tibetans are making in Tibet, Tibetans outside of Tibet as well, and with those of us in the room and many more around the world who are trying to come to terms with this, I think Om Mani Pei Me Hum right now you know, is the best I can do for a conclusion. So, thank you very much.